<clears throat> Hello and welcome to Malcolm Show episode 8, although this is being released after episode 9 due to some production issues. Um, essentially it boils down to the notes I took for episode 8 were vastly larger than I remember them being. So I'd started doing episode 9 because, oh well, I'll, I'll finish consolidating all the stuff for episode 8 and it'll all make sense. To boil that down quickly, what I've decided to do is I'm going to finish going through the notes I had for episode 9, just so there's a sense of continuity with all these episodes. And then, because I've realised that the notes I'm taking are exceeding the length of each episode individually, I'm just, I'm not going to label them so much as episodic notes it's just as well that's its own concept which i think i want to get into at another time basically it boils down to something i'm labeling algorithmic seasons which is kind of similar to the concept of algorithmic campaigns and cycles and stuff like that and it's something i've noticed that every once in a while my search engine security contract social media, streaming platform, all these algorithms, they kind of, not simultaneously, it's more over the course of a few days or a week or so, they all kind of adapt to the new cycle, as it were, and something new comes up. For instance, quite recently, I've noticed that two people that come into my search, um, into my recommendations quite frequently are Faraz Sahabi and Rowan Atkinson, two people that I think the algorithm knows I like, however it's interesting that they're all of a sudden very prominent and in quite a few of the suggestions I've been receiving. So that's something I'll go into in the future. Today I'm going to finish off the episode 9 stuff. So, without further ado, let's get started. Okay, so last time I went into stuff about socialised being emotional crutches when regulated unhealthily and about sympathetic mental health conditions and that kind of touch on those briefly before we get into the rest of it i basically feel that most social interactions are an emotional crutch if you don't understand why you're in a relationship in the first place there are some instances where it's not unreasonable or unhealthy to have uh social interaction with people if anything we're quite so people are quite fond of reminding human beings how social we are generally i think it's actually quite important to maintain a balance between healthy and unhealthy relationships as well as productive and unproductive relationships. I think most people allow themselves to get distracted by the fact that they have a social relationship at all and that distraction of the fact of their social relationship is actually detrimental to their whether it be personal freedom, personal success and doing what they're doing. Well it's level one so what do you expect? Okay, so sympathetic mental health stuff. So it's the idea of it's similar to like, it's not uncommon for people to get sympathetic physical health conditions in response to people around them. I think one most people have heard of is the idea of sympathetic labour pains, where the male partner experiences pain somewhat similar. I don't know the exact of it. It's, it's somewhat similar to a female labour pain. And they experience it as a consequence of their partner going to labour with the baby and experience that so convincingly that they feel that they're experiencing something similar. The other stuff that I want to go through, uh, so let's, first one on the list is unproductive fun being empty, much like empty calories. So uh, another one being streamable reality makes life a game. Algorithmic currents, electric currents, water currents, and wind currents. So they all flow, they can be steady, they can be surges, stuff like that. And then the political algorithm, politicalization of algorithms. So there's monetization, politicalization, and weaponization. And I've noticed how they target people for what you could call behavioral modifications. Some people might call them upgrades. However, I suppose that's a perspective based thing if it's not purely objective. So starting with unproductive fun. It's something I've noticed recently where what I compared it to in my head is the idea of unproductive fun being similar to empty calories. So for instance, empty calories in something like alcohol, where it, it's a poison. Alcohol is nothing more than poisonous to the body and doesn't actually help it do anything except maybe function as a social lubricant. Alcohol is just not good for you, full stop. And... 
something I've noticed a lot of the time is quite significantly with social media and streaming platforms is how frequently most people engage in what I would call alcoholic style behavior or even addicts behavior where they're just clicking they're just scrolling it's similar like with chess you said oh I'll just do this move because whatever I'll do this move oh look if I do that it'll hit the knight yeah it does something but it's not productive it's just an empty oh, I get to capture a piece however when you think about it you've moved the same piece twice and you haven't actually achieved much all you've done is exposed and you're, you're trading off a piece rather than capturing anything in the same way that with jiu-jitsu some people will aim for oh I really want to get this submission so I'm going to go for this position it's like well hang on you go into that position without realizing you're in a compromised position and you're going to get flipped over you're going to get swept and you've actually lost about before you even started in the same way that I think I think alcohol has ultimately been detrimental to society I think it you can argue alcohol is actually responsible for a lot of good in society simply because it's acted and functioned as a social lubricant and brought people together I don't want to ignore that capability of it however I also don't think alcohol is anywhere near as healthy for society as many people would like to believe i think alcohol is actually far more detrimental to the health of society than its long-term success there's a statistic i heard recently was the proportion of alcohol related deaths in the united states has more than doubled since 1999 which honestly didn't actually surprise me that's I think kind of speaks for itself and not in the sense that my opinion is like oh my god it's more that alcohol related deaths have more than doubled in the past 20 years compared to all years beforehand and you can say that's an availability thing probably is to some extent an availability thing i also think people were far too quick to try and drown their pain rather than actually face their problems head on i didn't know i could do that that's quite cool um, anyway, yeah, let's fix the blunder first. I think many people are quick to figuratively bury their heads in the sand and hide from their problems rather than actually address them straight on. Something I say frequently on this show and in real life is that most mental health professionals would be out of work completely if people were better to each other. It's not that hard to listen to somebody. It's not that hard to take an empathetic position. It's And the thing is, these skills that some people might find difficult aren't actually super complicated. A lot of it really is just based in active listening and having an interest in a person beyond your own personal gain. And I think that's reminiscent and it echoes of capitalistic attitudes. And this is not a pro-communist situation. It's the issue between the purest forms of capitalism and more ethically constrained forms of capitalism because then if you think about capitalism because and everybody else is responsible for moving these vast vast amounts of money at the expense of other people's lives they're doing so to protect their interests which isn't just their portfolios it's to look after their families and their legacies their friends families and all the things that they care about and it's very hard for us to say that if we were in their similar position and had been raised in a similar function of the system given the same rewards it's hard to say we'd actually behave any differently in the same principles like everybody loves to say that they'd if they were in a war-stricken country and there were a fugitive member of society nudge nudge wink wink if you know what i'm talking about there are several people that like to think oh yeah i'd protect all those targeted people absolutely like, no you wouldn't most of you just wouldn't you're far too indoctrinated to a system that you are dependent to live on you just wouldn't be as defensive as you think you are and that's not necessarily wrong that's not necessarily a bad thing that's just you being you that's you being human we're all flawed to some extent nobody's perfect the problem is everybody likes to virtue signal this idea of oh yes i'd look after people and i'd be part of the French resistance and I'd help hide Jewish people during World War II Germany or I'd uh, help feed the Ukrainians during communism and the Soviet Union and all these sort of things it's like sure you would you can say that because right now there's nobody actually calling you out on your action there's no way for you to be what's the phrase I'm looking for 
There's no way for you to be proven wrong. And I think that's a significant issue to it, is because you feel you can't be proven wrong in that situation, it's quite easy to virtue signal to others and let them know that, yeah, I do this, I do that. It's like, yeah, would you though? Stop pretending to be a good person by saying all these wonderful things when your actions in real life speak very differently to who you are as a person. Okay? I mean, you know, I'm probably not any better of it either. I do my best to be what I consider a good person from what my perspective of life is. However, there's definitely stuff I've done which other people would consider immoral. There's stuff that I would consider immoral that other people consider absolutely acceptable. And this is the tricky thing. Is I think when it boils down to the political aspect of it all, most politics is a philosophical idea and most philosophical ideas are opinions on life. And opinions are really just built on the perspective of your environment and your upbringing. It's depending on which constant you were raised on will depend on your outlook on life, not just in a cultural sense, in an environmental sense. If you were raised in, let's say, Australasia or Oceania, which I'm not sure which is officially known as, you know which continent I'm meaning. So you've got Australia, you've got New Zealand, you've got all those countries which are just south of Southeast Asia, very, very warm climate, very little snow. The cultural development and so, for example, look at the sports around there. Stuff like surfing is really, really common around there. Volleyball, stuff like that. Beach sports, because the weather is so good around there. If you compare that to aspects of like Northern Europe, for example, your Scandinavian countries, your Russia, uh, even the UK to some extent, are all much, much colder environments. So the culture that's evolved from there is very different. And then you compare that again to a more temperate climate in the middle. Think not even Mediterranean with your France's, your Germany's, your Italy's, your Spain's. Think again to South America, where you've got Brazil, uh, like Argentina, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Uruguay, Venezuela. All these countries have different climates, and I really do think that affects the culture of how they've been raised up. It's Who's to say which is better or worse is not the point. The point is, is that the cultures that have stemmed in those parts of the world originated from having to adapt to the environment around them. So you could almost say that the environments that have, in, from our perspective of the modern world, become quote-unquote first world countries have done so because of the environmental advantages provided to them for example it's not it's i'd say it's probably hard if you took 10 human beings without any survival training and asked them to work together on all different aspects in a few different countries around the world if you put them in a sahara desert they're less likely to survive than if you put them in you know the alps if you put them in Siberia they're less likely to survive than if you put them in Ohio just by a factor of the weather they're given more opportunity to survive in the same way that if you think about the wildlife in these places it's the wildlife in the Sahara Desert or Siberia is much much more sparse than it is in perhaps the forests of Central Europe or even the forests of South America or South Asia there's just a lot more wildlife going on. Granted, the wildlife in South America and South Asia is more dangerous than in Central Europe. However, it does provide more sustenance. There's not just the animals, there's the plants. And in that sense, you're providing more chance to live and survive. And I think that over time then starts forming various cultural opinions about what is the best way to live life. And, you know, things like the, the feminine and masculine perspectives on things. And then as you get further through time and economics becomes more than just the simple well if economics does kind of boil down to supply and demand it becomes more than just a simple okay we've got a village do we have enough bread do we have enough fish okay cool do we have enough shelter for everybody cool is everybody alive cool is there anybody else we need to worry about is there animals is it people yada yada and the thing is that very simple explanation there you can extrapolate it across many many levels in the same way that the mayors of modern cities whether they be in America, Asia, Europe, or Oceania. The point stands is all of these different places, it's the same principle. Are your people fed? Are they sheltered? Are they safe? It's 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 something I've noticed is that I'm kind of off top and trying to find my way back to my original notes. It's just it's something that comes to mind quite a lot and I'm just gonna go with it for a bit is people get really bogged down in their own personal viewpoint because they haven't had much comparison. And you can argue to some extent that traveling is really good for that sort of thing. I'd say in another sense, it's just meeting people from different cultures. And something that might be slightly controversial to say is, 
I think there is a benefit to having a specific style of society where instead of focusing on diversity, you focus on homogeneity. Simply because you've got people that grew up similar to you and you understand why your society is the way it is. And I'm not trying to be intentionally controversial this as much as I'm just trying to explore something I find interesting. I think most people have been sold in the idea of diversity because of the idea of don't hurt their feelings, it's mean to hurt people's feelings. And whilst hurting people's feelings without any due cause is cruel, I do think it's worthwhile listening to the people that do that sort of thing just to understand their perspective on matters. The quicker you understand their perspective, the quicker you can either destroy their argument or support their argument, whichever end side of it you end up being on. Or if you're just completely neutral to the matter, which, let's be fair, as human beings, being completely neutral is kind of unrealistic. It's a bit of a fairy tale ideal to be completely neutral about stuff. It's nice in theory, however, realistically, being completely neutral is kind of... It's a naive thing, in my perspective, to imagine you can really, truly be completely neutral. Something either is or it isn't, it's... I feel I'm getting off topic from what I wanted to talk about originally, which is basically most politics is just philosophy, which is just opinion, which is just an evolution of environmental culture. So the tricky thing is, on a long enough time scale, does that mean that entire worlds will... entire countries will then form like sort of Orwellian supercontinents and then we have the whole globalist idea where everybody shares one culture and everybody gets along and it's all happy days utopia and I don't want to be pessimistic to the idea of forming a utopia I just think we need to be realistic about what creating a utopia entails because think about how right now in the world people are very much encouraged to share in other cultures, right? Well, if we're sharing in other cultures, then the culture that we're supposed to be sharing in has to survive, right? So if the culture we're sharing in has to survive, then there has to be a culture to survive. And if there isn't, if the cultures all become homogenized into one uniform culture, then there isn't any unique culture to share in. It's just... What's the word? It's just all uniform. And if it's all uniform, there won't actually be any of these unique things that make us different from each other. I remember when I was a kid, we were told to celebrate our differences. And I think that principle is actually a really, really good one because celebrating our differences isn't about eliminating all the things that make us different. It's about celebrating that, all right, so this kid's from... Pakistan, or this kid's from China, or Nigeria, or Poland, or Scotland, or France, or Italy, or Brazil, wherever, man, it's, you can't really change where you're born, it's something that just happens, right? So, it kind of perplexes me that people are so ingrained on the idea of eliminating their own culture to adopt somebody else's culture. It's like, well, why are you adopting somebody else's culture? What's wrong with your own culture? I mean, if you really prefer somebody else's culture, that's cool, man. You do your thing. It just... It just seems to me that people are in a bit of a rush to... run away from what makes them them and not accept... Forgive me if this is not the most streamlined stream of consciousness. It's it's a train of thought that, as with most of these episodes, it's, it's trains of thoughts that are in my head, and I understand to some extent, I just haven't actually put into words before. And as much as I've written stuff down, a lot of the time when an idea comes into my head and I get going with it, I haven't experienced it before. I haven't... Well, maybe not... That's the wrong way to say it. It's not that I haven't experienced before, I just, I haven't before put it into a vocalised context. It's it's something I've noticed a lot with writing, is sometimes that I can have an idea in my head that I didn't realise was there until I put ink to paper or I'm typing something up. 
it's there's so many times where the idea isn't fleshed out however it does exist and whether or not I had it in my head all along or I had to capture it for whatever reason the uh, chess terminology it's still the idea had to come from somewhere right so if the idea had to come from somewhere it's it's the idea of inspiration and a muse. It's finding out, apparently, chess is enough a muse for me that it can bring stuff out of my head just because there's a competitiveness to it. And I think that in its own way talks about survivalism stuff, which, to me, if I don't put in the effort to try and survive and win the game, I lose the game, and why play a game to lose? It just, that's, that's basically being suicidal, right? It's, the whole point of these games is like no matter how friendly a competition you want to have you're supposed to want to win if you don't want to win what's the point and it's echoing notes i made earlier about something in my episode 8 notepad is <laughs> the difference between biological and digital algorithms is digital algorithms don't have to worry about reproduction because so it kind of comes down to like um mirroring behaviors where I feel that because algorithm, it's, it's another resonance of dead internet theory, is that human behavior has mirrored algorithmic behavior simply because algorithms have been around so long that they've actually influenced the culture. For example, if I say comment, like, share, and subscribe, you all know what I mean immediately. You all know where those buttons are, and the algorithms know exactly how to get as many comments, likes, shares, and subscriptions out of you as possible. And that is what they're trying to actively do all the time. That's what an algorithm is designed to do, is to to drive up engagement, retain engagement, and then, you know, bring in new people. It's like any business. So once you've got a customer, you want to hold on to them as long as possible. You're not supposed to want to let them go. Every customer is supposed to be kept on. And then, and that's it. Once you understand that, you realize the idea of it's, it's weirdly similar to slave driving, is once you have a slave, you're not supposed to release that slave until you receive either payment for them or they die. And that feels like a slightly... Why am I repeating the same bloody words? And it feels like a cold way to describe everything. However, it it makes sense to me. And sometimes I need to phrase it in a way that makes sense to me that's perhaps offensive to other people so I can understand why it's offensive to other people and then I can rephrase it in a way that still makes sense to both people and isn't as offensive. Because whilst I feel like the tricky thing with being offensive is that most of the time people who say, well, I say most people, most of the time I know if I say something that's unintentionally hurtful or insulting or offensive or upsetting, I didn't mean to. It's something that I maybe did unconsciously. And it's something I've said before is that I know that myself, It's there's an Eminem lyric that speaks about this, is like a whole generation of kids who if it weren't for rap music might have been raised to be racist. That's not the exact lyric, however it's close enough you're getting the point of it. It's like, if I hadn't listened to as much hip-hop music as I had, I might not actually be as, is it empathetic or sympathetic? Empathetic, I think is the correct way to put it, to a the saying Black Lives Matter, I think the movement Black Lives Matter is a political agenda, and that's a different thing. The statement of Black Lives Matter, I agree with, of course, human lives matter, that's the point of it. And I just, I remember as a kid, like, I I think we've all watched off from when we were younger, that, like, we go back to, the, oh, well, there's actually quite a lot of stuff in there that's slightly offensive. And then you, like, watch it a few years later, it's like, oh, that's actually kind of outright racist or sexist and stuff like that it's like huh is that is it still funny or is it was it funny because it was because of the shock factor at the time or because that's just the way things were then and people have regressed since then it's it's a tricky one i know that there's definitely some so for instance i don't know how well, i'm getting close i'm much closer to 30 than i'm 20 I remember being in primary school, and even early high school, where making accents wasn't meant to be an offensive thing, it was just play for fun. So, 
for example, I'm French Scottish. There's quite a few times I'm, when I say that when I reveal that information, I'm asked to oh say something French or oh do a Scottish accent and this is that and the other and it's like. I mean, I can do if it's in good nature. However, sometimes I do feel a bit like, dance, monkey, dance, entertain us. And I know that my experience is not quite as severe as other people's that have in a similar connotation. I'm just saying that, like, when I was a kid, for example, um, there was a, a show called The Jackie Chan Adventures, and their, Jackie Chan's uncle had a very distinct voice. And it was a voice we used to emulate simply because it was we liked the character it was fun and it was like yeah we were quoting him it was like an homage rather than an insult and i think the tricky thing is if somebody who didn't know us and hadn't watched that show heard us making those quotes out of context it could very easily be misconstrued as being offensive and i think that's not an uncommon factor in a lot of places is some people genuinely you know love these shows they love these shows they love these characters they don't want to you know, they're just having fun. They weren't trying to have fun at somebody's expense. They were quoting the show that they grew up on and loved with. It's, And I think it's what I'm trying to describe is a lot of the time when people say things that have been either correctly or incorrectly, that's not the point here, things that have been perceived as offensive for a broad term, it's... It's not always intentional. In fact, it very rarely is. There are some people who are just being dicks, and I know a few. Well, the thing is, alright, the person I'm thinking of when it comes to mind, I don't know if they're intentionally being a dick or if they're just thinking in a super objective manner. It was in a professional context, and without trying to dox myself too much, it was a hiring process where, this, when I inquired about it, it's the specific ethnicity of the applicant was chosen for the interview because of their ethnicity because the hiring person's previous experience with people of that ethnicity was that they were very hard workers and my first thought was hang on that's okay let, i'm going to listen to him a bit further and before i've jumped to any conclusions because it seemed like i think the term is positive racism that might be wrong it might be correct it's not the point i guess it is the point is when i asked him what's he like as a person yeah it seems nice it didn't really seem to give a damn about him as a person. It just... Uh, I don't know. It's The weird thing is, I feel there are bigger issues in the world than racism. I feel like economic disparity is a much bigger problem facing people around the world than racism and sexism. I'm not saying that those problems don't exist and I'm not saying they don't matter. I'm saying stuff like economic disparity and access to education are bigger issues i think because once you start leveling out the economics of the world so that regardless of where you are or what your circumstances upbringing were there's a level of income where you're not worried about being homeless or starving or you know you can interact with society and stuff like that in the same way where there's access to education i mean if you don't want to go to college or university or that that's fine you don't have to if you don't want to get your master's, your PhD, or whatever doctorate you're after, that's fine. You do you. It's not a judgment call. Because everybody's different. It's the fact that everybody should have an opportunity to do those things. And that, to me, that's what equality is about. And this is what I'm saying about the whole politicalization of the algorithm stuff. It almost Because part of me is wondering if that because political stuff tends to get more responses from... Sorry, I realized I was talking away from the microphone there. Political stuff tends to get a lot of responses because it triggers a visceral response within the human beings. I think the understanding of what equality is definitionally has been incorrectly explained. Equality is about equality of opportunity, not equity, which is equality of outcome. And take sports as a simple example. If you put, take every kid who wants to play sports, bring them to tryouts, right? Every kid gets to have a go at the tryouts for the sports. Okay, let's say. Okay, one of the most popular sports in the world, football, it's 11 people in a team. If you've got 1,100 people turn up, you're only going to have 1% of them that can actually be on the starting team. So if you, you know, it's like with anything, it's like I was saying earlier with the game, you don't play the game unless you want to win the game. So if you've got a sports team, in this case football with 11 players on the pitch, and let's for argument say you've got 11 substitutes as well, so it's 2% of the total applicants have a chance of making the team. 
you might retain some of the other ones just as mm, they're actually pretty good we're not sure blah 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 the point stands is you're going to pick the most useful players you're going to pick players that have actually got some natural skill or have incredible physical attributes or maybe there's one where their physical attributes are like slightly above a few of the others however their attitude and their commitment to the team that's outstanding their ability to raise morale that's so incredible that will boost everybody else's stats up and overall the team wins as a net gain and to me it just seems that that's for the, that two percent to make that best team possible the 98 percent have to by definition not be good enough it doesn't mean that they're not good at football they might be that other 98 percent that might be the thousand and ninety thousand and seventy eight people they might be the next best thousand seventy eight people in the whole world at football i mean the billions of other people in the world i mean they might be better than every single other one however if you're let's say there's interplanetary football we're going to pick the best players from the very best teams and those best players from the best teams as it stands are if I remember correctly, teams such as Barcelona and Bayern Munich and Juventus, Real Madrid, uh, Man City, uh, pa Paris Saint-Germain. I mean, these big, big teams, that, yeah, they've got the budget for it and all that, but the point stands is they've got the best players, so most likely the Earth starting eleven is probably going to constitute most of those best teams. It's like if you look at the French national team, German national team, Italian national team, uh, you know, whatever country you're looking at, uh, Russia, Argentina, Brazil, all these countries, their starting teams have players from the best, they don't recruit, they've got their entire nation to pick players from, they're not picking players from their local pub team, are they? They're looking for players who've won, played the professional level, two, played the highest professional level, three, played the highest professional level, and start for their teams and stuff like that. And... It just feels like, it feels a little bit like I'm rambling now. It's just, the point I was trying to make is that it's the balance between subjective and objective and it's the political side of what's equality and equity and there's definitely something that's in my head that's bothering me that I haven't quite got to the bottom yet and I'm trying to figure out what it is. It's one of the reasons I enjoy doing these podcasts is because it helps me understand stuff that's either inherently bothering me or stuff I don't understand. Hmm. Okay. So, on to the point I was making earlier about unproductive fun, sort of with me rambling there, is... You can argue to some extent it's productive because it helps me put my thoughts into a coherent stream. Except, apart from me getting a slightly better understanding of how I think and a better way to enunciate my words, what's the word? Um, articulate, that's the one. Instead of me articulating my thoughts better, it's I'm articulating thoughts that might not be super helpful in the same way. Like, you getting better at using your social media platform is that actually... Uh, conducive use of your time or is that just you getting better at using a social media platform that wants you to stay on the social media platform like right now is me getting better at chess actually helpful to life skill or is it just helping me get better at chess because chess.com thinks that if i get better at chess i'll spend more time on chess.com and the same like i can argue that chess has helped me in a few different real life aspects it's introduced me to people it's actually helped me in some professional circumstances it's done quite a few good things for me. However, I mean, you can say the same for social media. It's There's context is the massive thing about it. So, part of it is discerning what's productive and what's unproductive. And I think a massive part of that is understanding what we consider productive. So, for instance... In a sense that I can acknowledge alcohol does have a use as a social lubricant and it's entirely possible that entire global political situations have been calmed down by the presence of alcohol. At the same time, the fact that alcohol was needed to smooth over those situations in the first place rather than 
all the participants being level-headed enough to respond calmly, I think speaks more highly of the situation in the first place is why do human beings need alcohol to calm down? Why do you have to be drunk to have fun? Why do you need to have a drink with somebody to recognise them as... It's something I've noticed. I'm not trying to get all preachy with, since I'm clean and sober. It's So I voluntarily abstain from alcohol, caffeine. Uh, I wrote these all down somewhere, actually. Alcohol, caffeine, cannabis, cocaine, nicotine. I've also really been hearing a slight uptick in the recreational heroin use in the world which is kind of scary considering how vicious that i mean if you think cocaine's a hell of a drug wait till you try heroin that shit is i've not tried it personally i don't want to mislead anybody thinking i have the stories i've heard from people who firsthand who have it's it's too oh it's it's too close, like the best feel. It's like waking up as a child in a warm bed, knowing that you don't have to worry about anything in the world because everything's been taken for you. It's a big warm hug from both of your parents who aren't fighting and they just want you to be happy and you're never going to have to face any responsibility because everything's been taken care for you and a million, billion, trillion other things that just make life stress-free and happy and warm and all of that. So, whilst I can describe myself as clean and sober from all this stuff, it's, I've noticed it does actually, weirdly, like, I try not, to, I don't feel I'm judgmental towards other people for their choices. Whether or not they perceive me as being judgmental, I guess I, I'll have to work on and do my best to, you know, not be a dick. It's, <laughs> alcohol, I think, is the biggest one that people feel judged for because I think alcohol is such a massive part of especially western society social life that it's actually become a really serious problem it's become very seriously detrimental to western society it's I think alcohol is actually taking away more lives than it helps because People are just like drinking away their problems. They don't like actually talking about them. So many people would rather just have a drink and chat shit and communicate about some nonsense that doesn't actually matter rather than address the problems at front and hand. And rather than address the problems at hand. And that bothers me. It really does. It's... Honestly, I wish the people in my life were all sober, because then maybe I wouldn't feel so alone about it. Because I know... I don't drink anything, whether it's juice or milk or water, which I listen in alphabetical order, however, there's that hierarchy in reverse is how my body chases new hydration for instance i i jokingly refer to myself and friends as a milkaholic because i know what the way i behave around milk is almost exactly the same as i behaved around alcohol like my head turns like i sip carefully i measure everything proportionately i buy stuff ahead of time like i've even heard like so because of my economic situation Milk is one of the simplest ways for me to get a substantial amount of calories and reasonably healthy proteins and fats in my diet. It's like when people say, you can just, how many, you, you can, three or four things of milk. And like, how long is it going to last you? And it's like, I can just hear the echoes of it, man. And it doesn't go away. It's every, all the time, forever. And the problem is, is if I go back to drinking alcohol, it just, the alcohol wins. And... To me, it's like accepting that 
I'm incapable of interacting with society without the aid of a substance. It's the same reason that when I had mental health issues, I tried the prescription medications. It just... I don't... They didn't help. They switched something off. However, what they switched off switched too much off. Does that make sense? It wasn't... helping in the sense that it got rid of the good stuff it was getting rid of all the stuff it just it was horrible man i really didn't enjoy it it's honestly i find it is much much more conducive to my mental health to actually address it with therapeutic behaviors such as diet exercise hygiene sleep hygiene was a really big one for me and other therapeutic behaviours such as writing, talking, like reading, talking, writing, it's sort of, this is why, one of the reasons, like, I'm, I don't mean to be, like, a super old fart about it when I talk about how technology is actually destroying our ability to socialise with each other, because I think on a deeper level, a lot of technology is actually responsible for mental health, it's, all the social media stuff, it's, creates the illusion of socialising, which is just fake socialising, which means it's just hollow, it's empty calories, it's empty socialising. It's it's like there's a one of the sort of buzzwords that's been coming up a lot recently is uh, parasocial relationships. And what I notice with that is because people have TVs on so much of the time, I don't think the brain's actually as good at discerning the difference between what's a real conversation and what's a screen conversation. So, humour me whilst I describe this. It's Let's say, for example, you've got a podcast on, which is, let's say, is a group of people are talking or a pair of people are talking, whatever it is. I think the brain interprets it more. Maybe it's just my brain. I should say that now. I think some brains, maybe all brains, I don't know, interpret it as being in the same room as the people having the conversation. As in, they're listening to some, like, it's more of a window into a different room or a portal into a different room than it is a screen replaying an image of a different room. And I think the brain interprets that information in such a way that it feels like a social relationship when it really isn't. And I think that when you extend that idea to music, it's like, it's almost as if like, if you've you've ever heard the idea of like the Godhead of having God's voice with you in all places, it's like that's kind of what having music is. You're always listening to somebody who you can't see or touch speaking to you so all the music you're listening to it's like having god's voice following you and speaking with you and by that same logic it's whenever you watch a show it's as if you're i mean you can describe it in the idea of escapism however i think the concept of escapism here is far more literal than the idea of a distraction i think it's the mind might really not be able to discern the difference between fiction and reality and when that happens that's really severe man that's i don't want to label any specific mental health conditions as a consequence of it there are a few that come to mind with it however i noticed that there's been a few times where when i felt switched off and i wasn't hearing uh films or music or podcasts or anything in or whatever in that sense I didn't feel alive I didn't feel dead it felt less alive it felt I didn't feel as included in what was going on and I think that's part of what the issue is is I feel more included with what's going on on the shows on you know films music shows regardless of which ones they are without having because now I can understand it in that context sometimes it's 
I just feel like I'm listening to it. These days, it honestly feels like whenever I'm listening to a podcast or anything like that, I'm just, I switch them on with the perspective of I'm going to listen to these people having a conversation, as I think most people do. I'm not sure if the brain can discern the difference between a real-time conversation and a recorded conversation. And again, maybe that's just my brain, maybe it's just some brains. What I'm saying is I think it's a much more significant factor, especially considering there's the, the prevalence of mental health conditions and their diagnosis. Is, is that because technology is advancing faster than human evolution can keep up with it? That's, I think, the heart, at the heart of what the matter is here is I think it's Moore's law that says the chips in computers advance at an exponential rate which means if technology is advancing at an exponential rate then in a long enough timeline it's going to be advancing faster than humans can keep up with it maybe we've hit that level already i mean i think most members of society can quite happily accept the notion that we're not actually as mature as we'd like to believe we are we're not as we're not as wise as we like to think we are. We're not as intelligent as we like to think we are. All these things, man. That's, that's not necessarily bad. I mean, in the eyes of God or supercomputers or extraterrestrial life forms or anything superior to us, perspective-wise, we're like children to them. It's in the same idea as... Um, there's a really cool thing I remember reading where... Or maybe I heard it in a podcast. Is when human adults look at babies or infants there's that warm sort of you silly sausage you don't know the mistakes you're making it's okay i'll look after you all that kind of like warm fuzzy feeling that paternal instinct that maternal instinct paternal instinct whichever way you look at it kind of kicks in and it's like that's really normal and it was found in a study that elephants look at adult humans in the same way and i found that quite interesting because on what seems like a weird tangent, however, it's incredibly well connected, is it's a, I don't know if it's a physical dominance thing, because I've noticed that in combat sports and martial arts is the most capable in the gym, regardless of physical size, especially with grappling, where size doesn't matter quite as much. The thing is with striking, because size affects range, so once you understand range and you dictate the range, it's like somebody who comes in close, it gives you that bit more time and stuff, as well as size and power and stuff. The best fighters... There's a calmness about them that most beginners are almost entirely polaric, polarically on a different polarity. It's almost as if, in relevance to combat sports, martial arts, and yeah, MMA generally, I guess, is the better somebody is on average the calmer their disposition is because they don't need to prove themselves they don't need to let you know that they're the biggest baddest mofo around they just are it's in the same sense as like think about how calm a doberman or a rottweiler is generally until actually aggravated and then you could almost compare like think of how easily a chihuahua gets set off and stuff i know each dog has their own personality i'm just saying as an example it's it's an interesting comparison. And I'm trying to circle back to what I was talking about before is You know what's something? I'm gonna keep on this tangent for a minute. Maybe I'll find my way back more later on. Maybe I just need to keep going further instead of having this idea of like cycling round, maybe I can just move linearly for a bit and that forms its own cycle and it's a new cycle that's more interesting. Is I like being able to have conversations on these kind of tangents and it's something I've noticed a lot with technology. Oh, see, there we go. Is with the impact of technology on society's ability to socialize. It's without getting too personally divulgent. I've noticed that the relationships in which that I have a physical intimacy as part of it, somebody that I'm comfortable holding or hugging or anything like that. It's way 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 more intimate and i don't mean that just in the physical intimacy i mean in the emotional intimate way i mean 
that emotional intimacy and physical intimacy, emotional intimacy and physical intimacy, I think they work together. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that the more physically intimate you become with somebody, the more the emotional intimacy develops. I think the more emotionally intimate with somebody you can be, the more comfortable you are being physically intimate with somebody. I think intimacy has a broader definition than just those two aspects. I think there's a cognitive intimacy to consider. I was going to say mental intimacy, however, I think professionally the word cognitive intimacy are probably better to say. Because there's some people that you just kind of click with, you vibe with straight away. It's like, oh yeah, I kind of get this person. We think on a similar wavelength. And I think that in its own way circles around to what we were sa- I was saying earlier about culture. It's sometimes, I think to some extent, the people you vibe with really quickly probably have a similar culture to you. And I've noticed that myself personally, <laughs> I've all, I mean, obviously I don't know everybody's deepest, darkest secrets. The people I've connected with closest have also been through a significant amount of trauma. Now, my own personal trauma is contextual to my life. And the adult can withstand far more arrows than the child. Which is just a simple way of saying that like pain is relative. So, for instance, I didn't really know my dad for very many years. I still have my doubts over whether my dad is my biological father. Um, which then takes into question the sanctimonies, sanctimony, the fidelity. I think yeah, the fidelity of my parents' marriage, which then would explain the difficulty we had as home as a kid. And dad wasn't. He was working. He wasn't neglectful. He still just wasn't there. Mum was ill with cancer from primary school age. So half of my childhood. And then she passed away when I was 18. And I remember not being, like, all the dumb stuff I did as a kid, like getting in fights and just not being in the house and not really having any actual parental figures except friends' parents' figures from, like, the age of 12 or 13. And... You know, just various forms of abuse and stuff like that, which this isn't the time or place to get into it. I've noticed the people I connect with closest, it's almost as if their trauma has contributed to their personality in such a way that those who have experienced trauma to similar intensities have to seek out others who've been who have experienced similar levels of trauma in order to feel understood. And I think that connects to a quote, is it a quote or is it an idea? Not the matter. Of how the more intelligent you are, the more successful you are, the more capable you are, whichever metric you're measuring by, the better you are at something, the loner you feel in the general population. So if I describe that starting off, because I first heard it as an intelligence thing. So like say you have a, all right, so I've mentioned before that I have a, above average IQ. The numbers were the lowest I remember. I checked this. It was either, it was 137 was the lowest I've ever had it measured. And the highest was 187, which I was, I mean, I personally question the validity of that IQ test. However, if we firmly say that I'm not clinically stupid. So I've also found that a lot of the time I'll be talking about something which makes perfect sense to me, which then I kind of have to like simplify for other people. And its I don't think that's a matter of fact of how intelligent I am personally. I think it's a matter of how we explain things that feel obvious to us that others are potentially oblivious to. Because on some level, like what's obvious to the footballer isn't obvious to the rugby player. What's obvious to the rugby player isn't obvious to the hockey player. What's obvious to the hockey player isn't obvious to the basketball player, to the volleyball player, to the surfer, to the diver, to the skier, to the snowboarder, to the skater, to the martial artist, to the boxer, to the kickboxer, to, you know, keep going forever, this sort of thing. There are a lot of sports in the world. (laughs) In the same way, what's obvious to the athlete isn't obvious to the artist. What's obvious to the artist isn't obvious to the scientist, to the business person, to the politician, to the religious figurehead, 
what's obvious to the male isn't obvious to the female what's obvious to the adult isn't obvious to the child it's all this perspective stuff man it's not about being smarter or dumber in some ways it is as much as it is thank you about it's, there's a massive level of empathy involved it's understanding and being willing to put the understanding into the things and as i've said before people are willing to put more effort into being genuinely empathetic rather than the virtue signaling empathy that i see so often in the world like oh yeah i'll support this cause i'll put this badge on my social media or pardon me i'll donate money to this cause or i'll whatever i'll be charitable in this sense it's sorry i feel i feel i feel like i'm posturing not overly like vocally now but my hand like hands on my thigh string up a bit so i like to have a i'm trying to correct my posture gently i know it's after years i was like always really slumped over and just like steadily slowly slowly it's like I'm not trying to be like huge puff chest just you know just proper so that when i'm a bit older i'm not like eh. <laughs> it's yeah it's a massive thing man it's just understanding what makes sense to you won't necessarily make sense to everybody else and it's kind of like teaching it's the way you teach a six-year-old is different to the way you teach a 12-year-old is the way you teach an 18-year-old to 24 to 30 to 36 it's like so i was a climbing instructor for four years and a personal trainer as well and i'm i've loved sports since i was a kid i've like i remember competing in swimming i think before i was even in primary school or in very early primary school like i may have mentioned this in previous ones before for my own memories edification let's uh i competed definitely regionally maybe nationally with swimming i had like a good bit maybe 15 closer to 20 than 10 medals combinations gold silver stuff like that a few bronzes and so doing right for swimming i was on local football team where i did start some matches i didn't get much better than that with football i loved it i was awful at it uh taekwondo junior black belt which was quite it might have been a mcdojo still you know it's like eight or nine years old and most of the kids in the class the point stand is i paid attention enough that i was doing okay um what did I do after that? Uh, I'm not sure what sports I did specifically then. I think I was just playing then. Skateboarding. I was definitely one of the more confident skaters at the park. There was rugby, where I was on the school team. Basketball, where I didn't play for Scotland. I was picked for the squad, trained with them, and... I remember having ingrown toenails at the time because I was playing rugby at the same time as playing basketball and I had ingrown toenails which I think because my rugby boots are too small. I don't want this to like, I might have just genuinely not been good enough to play more of the basketball team. However, I know that my ingrown toenails were an issue at the time. So it might have been a little column A, a little column B situation. Um, powerlifting, I held the, I was Scottish record holder in the deadlift and I won the Scottish Open. And I did okay in the other... I don't even remember how well I did in the other one. I definitely I did better than I expected to, but it was a much higher level of competition. Climbing. I got up to, like... I'd on-sighted V8. I climbed a few. Climbed a few V7s. I did a bit of sport climbing. Like, nothing much... Like, I've on-sighted six... I think it was my first day ever climbing outdoors. I on-sighted 6B. But I was much more of a boulderer. I still am much more of a boulderer than a sport climber. Did lots of like deep water soloing and like trad climbing and soloing in that regard. That was much more what I found interesting with climbing was the adventure side of it, which I think is why I like bouldering. That was also when I was like generally much more suicidal. So maybe there's a whole other yeah adrenaline and danger myself yeah. Um, the gymnastic stuff as well. That was just funsies and accompanying training for other stuff. Jiu Jitsu first competition. Uh, me and a training partner from my gym swept the entire thing. He got all the golds. I got all the silvers. Um, I have had one Muay Thai interclub where I came second. 
Um, the thing is, I wanted to do it just to do it. It sucks that I came second. However, it's given me a much, much better appreciation. Because that's an interclub. It's not even like a pro fight. Or even an ami fight. Of much bigger appreciation of what they go through. So, like, sports-wise, I have a reasonably good understanding of what it takes and how big an impact it has on life. And I'm trying to figure out how I got onto this topic in the first place. Is... I think what it is, is generally I feel that... There we go. The competency thing's like... I've been athletic my whole life. I understand sports to a reasonably good degree and don't have much issue describing athletic concepts to other people. I've always found stuff... Let's... Yoink. I've always found sports kind of natural. I guess it's one of my natural fortes. I also think that being able to explain stuff athletically has helped me a lot generally in life just because it's taught me what meritocracy really is it's not just what it can be it's it's like with the whole like the smarter you are the more you understand just like the more athletically capable you are the more sporting activities you understand maybe not explaining that terrifically um, concepts, things like balance and direction of momentum and weight distribution and stuff like conditioning and how no matter how high skill level you're working at, physical conditioning matters and dedication and stuff like that. The thing is, is like so, the most recent examples are with martial arts and climbing. Climbing I'll use because I, I've I've climbed longer than I've been. Well, technically, I guess I did martial arts. Another point. It's like when I was climbing with people I was significantly better than. Like, I'm happy to help them learn and understand stuff. It's just sometimes I'll explain a concept which doesn't make sense to them that I have to physically demonstrate for them to understand. And then once I do that, oh. It's drilled home, it makes sense, everybody understands, happy days. And then, similarly, with stuff such as... Oh, oh, you beauty. Oh, you beauty. Academics, like, let's say you've got a PhD in quantum physics or mathematics. Explaining those concepts and ideas to a first-year college student is going to be pretty difficult. Explaining those concepts to... A first year high school student is going to be pretty difficult. Explain it to a primary school child. I mean, you can do your very best to explain. I don't even know enough about quantum mathematics or physics to give examples here. Let's just say there's some really complicated aspects you need to explain to a six year old. The ability of explaining those things to a six year old, I mean, that's just, just not doable. It's lonely. The idea of. And that's the thing is, and extrapolate that idea through success is they just don't understand. So it's it's why that I'm willing to be empathetic to people from all extremes of polarity because I think success isn't just the idea of monetary success or academic success or athletic success or musical success or whatever you want to describe it, man. It's I think because I don't want to shy away from quote unquote controversial topics. The idea of privilege is, and the thing is, I was saying earlier about unintentionally upsetting people. It's like a lot of the time you don't mean to be hurtful or insulting or offensive or upsetting. It's when you're able to, for example, let's say um, deadlifting. One of my strongest lifts, my best was like two seventy two kilo, about six hundred pound deadlift, right? Sumo stance, I know. Conventional was like past 500 so you know i'm not completely a weekend somebody who can deadlift 600 pounds trying to teach the nuances of deadlifting to somebody that's you know barely pulling one plate off the ground it's 
Mm. I can talk all about hip activation and st like talk about all right. So set your stance up, get your grip, make sure your shoulders are. You're not trying to pro chest. You're trying to pro diaphragm. You're trying to put your shoulders in your back pocket. You want to keep your head neutral, not turned up. You want to push your hips forward. You don't want to lean back. You want to keep the shin as cl your bar as close to your shins and your thighs and everything as possible. You want to make sure that you're driving through your heels and squeezing your hips in. All this stuff. That is a lot of information for somebody who's new to the sport, and it's. Regardless of your position of privilege, it's. I don't think that people in privilege should have to keep dumbing themselves down when it's more beneficial for the species as a whole, the society as a whole. I don't know why I wanted to say species there, because I don't know, I think I've used the word society so many times. I just wanted to diversify the vocabulary. Buzzwords. Um, yeah. So obviously. The guy that's deadlifting heavy has to simplify the import, like, instead of explaining everything all in one goes, like, reduce it to its core components, focus on those, even if the beginner is making a few mistakes with it, if they're getting the core concepts, the core principles all correct, then that's enough that you can work with and build on from there. And after that, it's... What was that there? Ah... It is kind of actually. Um, then you refine their technique over time. Say, oh, but hang on. It's like, but I thought that was, well, it's, it's, it's a yes and a no thing. So, for example, with, uh, with Jitsu, is like one of the things with you're taught as a beginner with arm bars is not to cross your legs one over the top. If you don't know what an arm bar is, it's the idea of imagine you've got somebody's arm between your legs. One of your legs is resting across their face, the other is across their torso. You've got their arm in between your legs, your hands are gripping their wrist, and you're pushing your hips together and upward to create pressure so that their elbow's bending, that if you kept going, it'd break their arm. There's If you cross your legs with that, it can actually reduce the pressure on the arm and provide them opportunity to escape. So beginners are taught not to do that. However, you will see higher belts, whether it be purple belt, brown belt, black belt, red belt, crossing their legs over in those situations because they know that if they cross their legs in a specific way, that they can actually exert more pressure or prevent an escape. However, the general principle is different for the beginner than it is for the advanced student because there's just more information going on. And it's trying to understand the holistic... Exp it's, it's that idea like everything is everything, everything's connected, and it's... thing is, I don't even know why I'm feeling this urge to talk about privilege. I really don't know. Uh, is it induced by algorithms? 